Hi friends! Last week I came out as believing in non-ordinary forces in the world and this week I want to talk about why that's a little bit taboo and give us all some ideas uh, for ways to overcome that taboo and to get back in touch with the magic that does exist in the world. I want to start by talking about Max Weber, a German sociologist of religion who uh, in 1918 popularized this term that is translated into English as disenchantment. And what he meant by that was that the Western world has fallen in love with science and has really fallen out of love with the idea that there's something magical or numinous or sacred about the natural world and about each of us as people. We tend to believe in what could be called a physicalist perspective, which is that everything is made of molecules, everything is kind of just inert matter, and therefore what we do to the environment, for instance, uh, doesn't, doesn't really matter. It's something that we are doing to a thing as opposed to like a living system. An important part of Weber's idea of disenchantment is that through science, we believe we can know everything there is to know about the world. So we use physics to understand how planets move. Uh, we use biology and all sorts of different disciplines to understand the natural world around us. And this idea that the world is disenchanted, that it's just made of sort of dead inert matter, whether that inert matter is a human or a tree or a rock, that it's kind of all the same thing. It's all just molecules. There's a huge amount of upsides to this perspective because obviously we've been able to figure out a lot about the natural world. We're able to cure diseases that back in the day could never have been cured. Um, our feats of engineering and all sorts of, all sorts of wonderful things have come from this supposed disenchantment of the world but it also has some darker sides too. So if you think about the environmental situation that we're in, um, the world, the natural world is not like protected from us by taboos or, you know, strict religious laws or anything because we don't think there's anything to it other than, you know, dirt and trees and all these things that we think of as subject to our will as humans. So for instance, I think this was Anne Klein who told me this story, but I heard a story of folks um, camping in Tibet and they were outsiders. They came and set up their red tent in the middle of a field and a nomad came running up to them and was like, no, 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 you can't set up like a red tent right here. What are you doing? And once they figured out, you know, what was going on, it turned out that the nomad was saying like, you're gonna upset the spirits who live in this area. The red doesn't go with anything else. It's standing out and it's gonna irritate the spirits of this place. So that would be like an enchanted response to like radical innovation or something that is like out of place within a traditional worldview. And obviously every time like a real estate developer decides to bulldoze an area and put a bunch of houses up on it, they're not thinking about the spirits who lived in that land or the trees they've cut down or the rocks they've had to move. Everything is just material objects to be manipulated as we see fit. As you can imagine, there are some pretty big downsides of living in an enchanted world. Like it, it really can tend to keep people in their place, so to speak. So there's a lot of gender inequality. Um, limits on people's personal expression. I mean, slavery was justified in a lot of traditional societies as being a thing that was okay. So there's obviously a lot that's wrong with a lot of societies that function in like an enchanted universe. So most people are not really in favor of just trying to go back from a disenchanted universe to an enchanted universe again. I mean, for most of us living in a postmodern age, that wouldn't work anyway. But there are a lot of people who, in response to the disenchantment of the world, the revelation by postmodernism that basically a whole bunch of people believe in a whole bunch of religious and other beliefs, and you can't necessarily say like any one of those is right or makes more sense than the other ones. There's just this huge chaotic marketplace of different sacred systems for the world. So some people have responded to this disenchantment and this postmodern proliferation of, of approaches to the sacred that could all be considered equally right or equally wrong. 
some people have respond to, responded to that by kind of going back into fundamentalist religion. So we're seeing an upswing in different types of fundamentalism around the world. And for most of us who have been raised in this kind of postmodern society, that's not really a viable option either. Um, especially those of us who maybe see truth and beauty in more than one religious tradition, there's no way we're gonna just try and fit ourselves back into one box again. So in that case, what do we do to try to move from a disenchanted universe to what some folks would call a re-enchanted universe? One solution that a lot of people are trying in a lot of different ways is to basically figure out our own ways of reconnecting with what's sacred in the universe. And this used to be done through religion, but I'm kind of enjoying right now thinking about this idea of like sacred but not religious. That there's just an element of ourselves, an element of the natural world around us that is already sacred and our job is more to tune into that sacred dimension of being than to try and pretend that there's only one way into that sacred dimension. So I have to offer you today one actionable idea that you could try. Um, this is something that I do every day and it's basically making an offering to the ancestors or to the lineage. So what do I mean by that? Um, in cultures all around the world, they have this idea that your loved ones after they pass over to the other side become ancestors. And then it's our job as their living descendants to remember them, to make offerings, to propitiate them. And then it's their job or their natural inclination from the other side, so to speak, to help us. And right now is a time when we definitely need help. So in the first video in this series, I talked about, you know, calling on the lineage of Martin Luther King and Gandhi and like the Dalai Lama, even though he's still alive. Um, like these great people who have changed the world in times of upheaval or calling on a spiritual lineage like we do in Tibetan Buddhism, or even calling on our own personal ancestral lineage if that feels meaningful. So I wanna show you what I use to do that. I'm coming obviously from the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. So I decided to go with a very traditional Buddhist offering source, which is saffron water. So you can find saffron in a lot of grocery stores. Uh, you can definitely order it online if you can't find it in person. So what I do is I take this container of saffron and dump the whole thing into um, basically a coffee maker, like a French press coffee maker. Uh, you could put it in any kind of container that's heat safe. And then I boil about this amount of water. <laughs> I fill up this bottle with water and I boil it. And I let the saffron sit in there until um, the water is really colorful, as you can see. So if you let it sit for a couple hours, it gets really colorful. And then I use the saffron water to make offerings to my spiritual lineage and to my ancestors. And the way I do that is I bought a special glass that I only use for this. So every morning when I sit down to do my practice, I also pour a little bit of this saffron water into this special glass and I set it on my altar, which you can see behind me as I do my practice. And then after I do my practice, I bring to mind anyone who's suffering or, you know, ill or just in some way I feel needs extra support. But then I also bring to mind my ancestors. So my mom has passed away. She's on the other side, my grandparents, my great grandparents. There's plenty of people I've never even known about, but I try and mentally include them. I also think about all the different llamas and amazing beings in the spiritual lineage that I've inherited. And in Tibetan Buddhism, you can find different kinds of prayers and whatnot um, to make offerings, but you could also just make up your own prayer. May my ancestors receive this and may the connection between us be nourished. My ancestors, please bless me with the strength to keep showing up in the world in positive ways. So anything that feels good to you, you can use that as your own like little bitty prayer, um, make the offering. So when I do this, I, I sort of imagine these beings receiving the essence 
of the saffron water as I hold it up to them. And then I go and I take it outside and toss out the remainder because they've already received the essence. So I'm just getting rid of what's left. I clean out the glass, I put it back on my shrine. I'm ready to do it again the next day. And the last part of my own little homemade ritual is that I then take the empty bottle that the saffron was in and I fill it with a little bit of this saffron water. And then the next time I go outside for some forest bathing or to walk in nature, I kind of, well, first of all, I like to make sure that I'm not plugged into a podcast or music or talking on the phone or something. I, I like to just unplug from everything and then wait for a tree or a stone or a stream or something to kind of like call to me. And then I pour that saffron water as an offering to the nature spirits of that place. One thing I would like about my little system is that it has sort of a ritual element where every day I do the same thing. Um, I know what's gonna come next, but it also has more of a spontaneous flexible element. And I think if it were just supposed to be spontaneous, it would be kind of difficult to um, every day feel like I was coming up with a new ritual. And um, at the same time, I think it's really helpful to have some room in there for spontaneity so that the spirits can move me in a certain direction and I can just learn how to tune in a little bit to what they're trying to say to me. I hope that's helpful. And if you do this, I'd love to hear what happens for you. So please just leave a comment. So coming back to the topic of disenchantment, one of Weber's major arguments was that science had kind of undermined our ability as Westerners to, to recognize, to believe in, to take in the sacred aspect of the world. But I think, you know, he was, he was talking and writing in 1918 when he really popularized the idea of disenchantment. It's been a hundred years. And I think now we should have the humility as modern people to realize that science does not explain everything in the world. That there are in fact a lot of things that happen that demonstrably happen like near-death experiences and um, a lot of credible cases of children, children reporting previous lives, some of which have been verified, and a lot of other stuff too, that there's good data to believe that things, things happen. And right now, science actually doesn't have a model that can explain why or how they happen. But if you look at, for instance, Tibetan Buddhism and a lot of these other traditions that are coming from pre-modern contexts where the world was enchanted, they provide a whole theory, a whole structure for how these things are possible and how they happen. And obviously I practice Tibetan Buddhism. So for me, that's a really powerful, like channel back into an enchanted world. But there are lots of other channels back in as well. Um, whether it's contemplative practice or, you know, reading about quantum physics, all, all these different things that blow your mind and just crack open this sort of mechanistic model of how the world works. Like now science itself is undermining that mechanistic materialistic worldview. So I think we all owe it to ourselves to revisit the idea that the world is not sacred, that we are not sacred. Thanks for watching this video and I hope it was useful to you. Please like it or subscribe if you feel so inclined. Thank you and I will see you again later.